Thank you. So this is my first day, first PyCon, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and I want to talk about a really neat machine learning tool called Gaussian processes, how we can apply it to time series analysis. So a little bit about me. I'm a data scientist at JP Morgan. I've been a Python developer there for about six years. Um, originally, before that, doing a PhD in control engineering and reinforcement learning, which was all MATLAB scripts. So a very glad convert to Python. And I got up at 4 o'clock this morning to come down from Glasgow, so please be kind to me. I'm very tired. And do find me on LinkedIn. So firstly, an outline of what I want to talk about. What is a Gaussian process? How do they help us um, in this time series land? And what did I do about it? What was some code I wrote? So the theory behind all this comes from a brilliant project called the Automatic Statistician, uh, led by Zubin Garamanian team. So I'd encourage you to go and check that out after the talk. And as a little disclaimer, I'm planning to use no maths to introduce this topic. Although there's amazing mathematical underpinnings to Gaussian processes, uh, it can often be a bit off-putting, I find, when we're first being introduced. So I'd like to kind of give a high-level uh, intuitive overview. So what is a Gaussian process? Well, the way I like to think about a Gaussian process is that it defines a bag, a bag or a family of similar functions. By a function, I mean uh, just a mapping from inputs to outputs. So in the case of time series, our inputs would be time, our outputs would be like a stock price or a value that we're interested in. And this notion of similarity is encoded using a kernel or covariance function. And the kernel tells us, given two inputs or two times, how similar are the corresponding two outputs likely to be. That's all it does. As an example, this is the squared exponential kernel, um, a very common kernel when starting out in Gaussian processes. And all it's telling us is that when the difference between two inputs or two times is very small, it's close to zero, then the outputs of that time series are likely to be similar. Conversely, if the outputs are far away, the outputs are likely to be dissimilar. So this is the main piece that defines our bag of functions. And we can use it to draw samples from our bag and have a look at what they look like. So this particular kernel defines the bag of very smooth functions, which vary over a particular length scale. And these are a couple of samples of what those would look like. As you can see, they vary over um, a certain kind of range and points, inputs that are close together have outputs close together. Now we could have a play around with our kernel there. We could make it more spiky, which induces a more volatile looking time series, which vary more rapidly because the similarity between points that are further away, we've reduced that. Or conversely, we could blow it up a bit and make the, this length scale longer which induces correlations that last for longer. So we have these different um, looking time series. Now, very smooth functions are maybe not that common in real life. So we can also define kernels over different looking time series, ones which are very jaggy or non-differentiable, ones which are once differentiable or twice differentiable. And these ones are called the matern class of kernels and are very useful. And we can actually define many more kernels over different simple forms of functions. We could define distributions over lines of set point changes, or we can induce periodic behavior um, 
and also constants or white noise, or there's a broad range of these base functions we can make. And it doesn't stop there. We can actually easily combine these kind of base pieces together to produce more exciting functions. For example, we could encode a volatility change by combining a change point kernel with two kernels of differing length scales, going from long to short. Or we could induce a trend, so adding a linear kernel to another kernel to get functions with this kind of consistent trending behavior. Or we could introduce kind of quasi or approximately periodic behavior by multiplying one of these smooth kernels with a long length scale with a periodic kernel, which kind of acts to dampen out these long-term correlations. So we have this periodic behavior which evolves over time, which is very neat. So a Gaussian process defines this bag or family of time series and gives a, a really flexible language and framework to express lots of different times, types of time series. So slightly more accurately, a Gaussian process is a distribution over a space of functions, like exactly analogous to how a Gaussian distribution is a distribution over a vector space. If you look at the plot on the left, we've got a 2D Gaussian distribution where samples from that distribution are specific vectors, 2D vectors. And in exactly the same way, samples from a Gaussian process are specific instances of functions. So it can be useful to hold that in your mind. So how does this actually help us? So we can define a distribution of our functions. Well, so what? Well, here's what. We can combine them with observed data to make predictions in areas where we don't have data, for example, in time series to make forecasts. Or based on the data, we can infer, OK, what's actually the underlying structure of the bag of time series that this data was drawn from. And we can actually generate plain English descriptions of the structure that we find. So this is going to dive into these three aspects. So firstly, prediction. So let's say we have our bag of smooth functions where certain samples look like the dotted lines there in the diagram. And we're assuming that our actual function belongs to this, this bag or family of, of functions. But we've not made any observations of it. We just know it's part of this family. Now let's assume we make some observations at certain time steps or certain points on our inputs. Then how can we combine that to actually make predictions? Well, using uh, the tools um, available in Gaussian processes, we can create this posterior distribution. We can update our distribution over functions given this data. Or in kind of a crude terms, we can throw away functions which are in our bag which don't match this data. And predictions from a Gaussian process then come with this inbuilt measure of uncertainty. So when we make a prediction, our blue line there, um, we also get an estimate of the certainty in the prediction. So in areas where we don't have data, we get high error bars. And in areas where there is data, we've got high confidence, so low, low uncertainty, which is a really neat aspect of a model to be able to know when it's not sure. OK, how can we then use this observed data to actually find the structure of the time series beneath it. So to make those predictions, we assumed we knew the family of functions that our data belonged to. So how can we infer that from the data? So firstly, let's assume that we know the right kernel, but we just don't know the right settings of its parameter, for example, those length scales. For the data we saw before, we might think that the length scale was quite short. But uh, this induces functions which are very highly 
varying. There's not much correlation between points. And these functions seem too complex to explain that, that data. Conversely, we could tweak that length scale to be very long, and we get functions which look too simplistic to explain the data. But this seems about right, intuitively. So can we actually quantify this notion of just right? And the answer is yes. We can use this probability term called the evidence, which is the probability of the observed data given the parameters, in this case our one length scale, which we're choosing to tweak. And this actually encodes exactly that intuition. And it effectively gives us a way of trading off the fit to the data versus the complexity of the family of models that we're considering. And so that term is what we want to maximize by tweaking our parameters. And because we can actually write down exactly what that formula is under some basic assumptions, we can take gradients and use our favorite gradient descent algorithm to auto-tune these parameters. OK, but that's assuming we knew the kernel structure to begin with. What if we had a choice between two different kernels? So we can take them, we can tune their parameters to be the best fit to the data, but how do we choose between our two kernels? Well, we can use the Bayes information criterion, which effectively attempts to choose the kernel which has the simplest structure, i.e. the fewest parameters. It can penalize these number of parameters, so flexibility of the model, uh, if it doesn't add any additional explanatory power to the data. Which is great, but there's a lot of possible kernels we could try. We can't try them all. There's a big space of them out there. Which ones should we actually try? Well, one way, we could do a greedy search through the space of parameters. We can start with our, a base set of kernels, like the ones we mentioned earlier. For example, a smooth kernel, a linear kernel, a periodic kernel. We can tweak all their parameters by maximizing the evidence and find the associated BIC score. And then we can choose the one which has the lowest. And then we can create new candidate kernels by combining them using simple addition, multiplication, or change points uh, to create a slightly more complex set of kernels, which we can then repeat the process with and search down through this tree, increasing the complexity until um, we can't increase this BIC score any further. Great. So we now have a principled way to automate this search for the kernel which best explains our data, or which, best, or which provides the kind of underlying structure of the time series, of the underlying time series. OK, I mentioned that we can, these are also amenable to generating a simple plain English description of what we've found. And that's because kernels are actually defined by these interpretable parameters, things like length scales and periods and change point locations, unlike, say, a radial basis function or um, an ARIMA model where the parameters that are available don't have these kind of intuitive mappings to concepts that we understand. So it's therefore relatively easy to map these into a plain English description using a kind of templating approach. So we can do this in three steps. Firstly, we would break the kernel, our complex kernel that we found, into a sum of products using high school maths. And we can take some of these products and actually be collapsed into base kernels uh, with different parameters. For example, multiplying by a white noise kernel often just leads to more white noise. And finally, we could produce a description for each component in the sum by just picking one of those base kernels as a noun descriptor and the rest as these post-modifier descriptions. For example, if our component is a periodic kernel multiplied by a smooth function and a linear kernel, we can just map the periodic function to a noun phrase um, and the other two to these adjective-type appending phrases. 
Um, so we have a periodic function whose shape evolves smoothly with linearly varying amplitude. We can also include information about the actual parameter settings that we found. So with a period of 10.2 days and a typical length scale of 205 days. And actually this analysis, this auto analysis can actually be extended much further. And I would point you back to the automatic statistician work in which whole reports of the time series can be auto produced. Boom, so we've got a framework which automatically gives us a powerful predictive model, um, including uncertainty in the predictions, the underlying structure of the time series, and an automated way to produce an actual language description of our model. So what did I do about this? I thought, this is great. Where can I pip install this stuff? Sadly, this doesn't come as a handy Python package just now, although there are a collection of MATLAB and Python scripts out there, although they're not immediately usable. So I wrote my own very basic implementation of this. And my motivation was actually for, a tool, for this exploratory data analysis tool where we could throw this at thousands of time series uh, all at once and run this analysis on each one. And once done, would allow me to ask questions like, well, can you show me all the time series which display periodic behavior or have significant trends or which change behavior around this certain date or which exhibit high volatility around a certain time? I initially based my implementation on scikit-learn implementation of Gaussian processes, but I've recently been moving over to GP flow, which is based on TensorFlow, uh, and therefore auto-calculates your gradients for you, because who has time to hand calculate gradients in 2019? I spent my PhD doing that. I don't want to do that again. So that's my current state. Implemented a few new kernels. For example, these change point kernels don't come out of the box uh, with these base implementations. Implemented some periodic versions of these non-smooth kernels and a couple of domain specific ones in the data I was looking at often got this repetitive spiking behavior. So I encoded a kernel to capture that and often repetitive set point changes um, to find that kernel to capture that. Instead of implementing a greedy search, um, as I said above, we just went with a simple exhaustive search over a predefined do kind of domain-specific set of kernels, um, which was fairly easy to come up with, and implemented the auto decomposition and description parts that I mentioned before, and a Spark wrapper to apply this all at scale to my thousands of time series data set. So let's give it a go on a simple time series. So this is the air passenger data set, which you'll be able to find on Kaggle. And the idea is on the x-axis there, we've got months, and the y-axis is number of passengers um, for a certain airline for that month. And we have to predict uh, what this time series is going to look like going forward. So using my implementation, um, created a time series structure discovery module in which we just load up our data as a pandas series, instantiate this structure discovery class, and tell it that our data occurs monthly, run the fit method on this series, which goes away and performs this search through our space of kernels to determine what the best one is. And then we are able to perform prediction and description using simple top level methods. So the result on this data looks like this. So it's captured this kind of evolving periodic behavior where we can see the 
red line is our mean prediction, and the red area is the kind of um, confidence interval, which is slowly expanding as time goes on, which seems a very sensible prediction. And we also get this auto description falling out the bottom, which tells us that it's captured well, it's a period of 12 months, and this periodic behavior is evolving over some number of years. Try this on some other data. So we've got the Dow Jones index for the past couple of years. Around 2018 seems to be some kind of regime change. Can this stuff spot that? This is the result of running it. And we see it's picked out this regime change at the start of 2018 um, over a month or two period. And it's shown that before that period, we have a more slowly varying time, time series behavior evolving over about 204 days, moving to a more rapidly or more volatile um, regime after that, so with a length scale of more like 36 days, which is very neat. A couple of caveats. This naive approach doesn't scale very well. Um, the operations are n cubed for training, where n is the number of data points in our time series. We can reduce this uh, to something more sensible using something called sparse approximations. But secondly, the, na the naive approach doesn't actually handle outliers very well. However, there are other noise models that we can use uh, to encode outliers. And it's quite sensitive to local minima, as with any nonlinear optimization, we might get stuck in some suboptimal solutions or setting of these parameters. But if we made the training quicker, we can hot start in more locations and should be able to reduce that. So in conclusion, here's a quote by Kevin Murphy, currently of Google, who makes two points about the current state of predictive modeling and machine learning in that first problem is that although these machine learning methods are very powerful, currently they often require considerable human expertise to kind of choose and to train. And secondly, that whatever they discover is often quite hard to interpret. So I propose that these get this Gaussian process framework goes quite a long way to addressing these, these problems. So Gaussian processes are awesome. They give us a powerful predictive model without requiring deep expertise to train, and a model that's easy to understand and to explain. So go and check out the automatic statistician, and do reach out to me if you'd like me to clean up and open source my code so you can have a play around with. Um, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, that was fascinating. We have one minute for one quick question, if that's okay? Yes. Okay. okay. Anyone has a question? Um, I might have one. Um, I didn't quite get it. I apologize for that. The, brief, the first kernel where was the failing model. I didn't understand quite the reason it failed, if you could explain it more. What was the reason that the first kernel was not fit for purpose? Oh, uh, just because that first kernel encodes very smooth functions, uh, in fact, infinitely differentiable ones, which often the time series you encounter in real life are more jaggy. <laughs> so the, these kind of very smoothly varying time, time, time series are often not, don't capture real life data. Amazing, thank you very much. Give Joe another round of applause.